go ahead and stand. We'll be in the victorious hymns this evening. Turn with me to page 176. Page 176 of the victorious hymns. We'll begin our service with my Savior's love.
222. Page 222. Sing, I found a friend. Good to see everybody this evening, and good to be in the house of the Lord. We'll have our lesson tonight, and then we've got a, a business meeting, a short business meeting to follow after that. But, uh, 
good, good to see everybody here this evening. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll continue on. Cutter, would you like to lead us in prayer? Thank you, God, for this evening, and thank you for the privilege to be here tonight in safety and the, the uh, opportunity to give, given each of us to set aside time and uh, to worship you tonight, to sing praises to you, to magnify you in our hearts. I pray that we would also be prepared to receive the instruction you have for us. I pray that you'd give us grace as we consider the, the resources you give in this church and that we would be good stewards of those things throughout the business meeting as well, but especially now that you'd open our hearts to your word and to, to your working in us. I thank you for the privilege to be here in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Right. Hayden, did you have one more of those tally sheets left? Yes. Where's it at? Okay. Do we need to make one more copy? Oh, got, one. got one there? Maybe we can give that one to Jacob. I gave him one. Oh, he does. Okay, well then we're, okay, and Joseph there. We're good. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians again tonight, and uh, I'll just get right into the lesson since we've got other things to follow the lesson here. And uh, we're considering this question that the church in Corinth had asked uh, the Apostle Paul about eating meats offered to idols. And we saw that uh, the answer to this question involves uh, a general principle for us. You know, we, we don't have necessarily that same situation that occurs in our society today and in the, in the day in which we live. But the principle applies, and, we, and we're going to get into that tonight, and we can apply it to any similar situation that we encounter today. So the principle is stated, if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, in verse 9, we see the principle is stated here. This is where it's stated here, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, but take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. And so the question was, can we eat these meats that have been offered to idols if we're invited into somebody's home or if, if they're sold in the marketplace, can we eat those meats? And he said, we have a, we have a liberty to eat these things because they're, they're created by God and God's not put a prohibition on it for us and we have this liberty, but it may not be the best thing to do. And so he illustrated that. The principle was illustrated again for us. So not only did he state it, but then he illustrated it through uh, his own example. And, and he said, you know, I, I have the liberty to uh, be supported by the people to whom I minister. And so he said, I and Barnabas, we have this liberty to, to forego working uh, since we're laboring in the word and we're teaching and we're going around ministering to people. And uh, he said, but I, I'm not going to use that liberty, even though it's mine, because I don't want that to be a stumbling block to others. And so he said, I'm not going to use that liberty uh, for your sakes. He, he had chosen not to use it. He had it, but he chose not to use it. Paul then also used the example of a runner to illustrate the point. The runner runs and he trains and he sacrifices to obtain a prize, right? He, he has the liberty to eat all of the, well, I mean, I don't think they had milkshakes and ice cream floats in those days, but he had the liberty to eat, uh, let's see, what would be a good treat amongst the people in, in Greece in those days. Maybe, uh, did they have chocolate? Raisins? Lots of raisins? Yeah, maybe he could eat clusters of raisins which, with, uh, with honey on top, but he didn't because he wanted to stay fit and trim so he could win the race, right? So he had a liberty, but he chose not to use it because there, he wanted something else. He wanted another, another advantage. Then he also used the example of Israel, and this is where it really comes to the point. Israel in the wilderness, when they were traveling around in the wilderness, God had to teach them not to lust after evil things specifically idolatry, and to, to follow after the idol worship of the surrounding nations, the neighboring nations. And he made a very strong point of don't be tempted by the idolatry. Now, the, those, those 
idols, offer, uh, those uh, uh, sacrifices that had been offered to idols were, um, it, involved, it involved idol worship, right? The worship of false gods. And so he said, that's the one thing you don't want to be drawn into yourself, and you don't want to draw others into this as well by partaking of those meats. And for a Christian to partake in, in the worship of an idol is a sin, and we can't have fellowship with the Lord's table and the temple and the table of idols at the same time. There's got to be a separation. We worship God and Him alone. We don't worship those idols. But the, the point that's been illustrated here is that we cannot let our liberty become, become a means of temptation away from God, either for ourselves or for others. We can't let the liberty that we have be a means of temptation away from God. We may have a liberty, but if it's going to draw us away from God, we don't want to go down that path. Or if, or if our liberty is going to draw somebody else away from God, we don't want to be drawn down that path. So now we're going to get into chapter 10, and we're going to see the principle applied. We had it stated, we had it illustrated, and now we're going to see it applied. Beginning in verse 24, chapter 10 and verse 24. Let no man seek his own, but another man's wealth. Whatsoever is, now that doesn't mean we should go after other people's money. That means we're seeking what's good for them, okay? We, we're seeking, we put th what's good for them, their needs over our needs. Verse 25, so he really answers the question here. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, in other words, in the markets, that eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. So here we have the, the, the answer to their question. And, and this is the direct answer to that, eat, uh, that question about eating meats offered to idols. We have the, op or the liberty to eat anything, but just be sure to give God the thanks and the glory. If... if we give thanks for that which the Lord has provided. Why then are we going to be judged by somebody who's, who's got a problem with what it is that we're partaking in, right? If someone thinks we may be partaking in or even condoning idolatry by what we allow ourselves to eat, then we should forego the eating of that thing, right? So that's, that's really the, the point that's being made here. And in verse 29, he says, Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. So why is my liberty judged by another person's conscience? You've heard the saying, you know, you should always do what you, you know, follow your conscience. Let your conscience be your guide. What the Apostle Paul is saying here, let somebody else's conscience be your guide. Why would my liberty, why if by grace I've received this, God gave me this gift of this food, why should I forego the liberty of enjoying that food if somebody else's conscience is going to be offended? That's the, the question he asks. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? I gave thanks to the Lord for it. Why would you speak evil of me for partaking in that in which the Lord has provided? Why is my freedom limited by somebody else's conscience? 
Well, the answer is given here in verses 31 through 33. Wherefore, therefore, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. That's the limiting factor. Does it give God the glory or not? Not whether or not I think I deserve it or it's my right to have it, but does it give God the glory? Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. The last thing we want to do is to lead somebody away from God by the things that we do by our example, by the things that we allow, even if it's not something that's necessarily prohibited in the Bible, even if it is a blessing that we have of God, the last thing we want to do is that in partaking of that, we would lead somebody away from God or we would discourage them from following God or we would give them the wrong impression about God. And so that's where this, this boils down in our lives. Now I want to tonight... Um, examine some more applications of the principle, okay? The principle can be applied broadly, as I said, even though the situation presented at Corinth was quite narrow, and, and, and that, by that I mean the eating of meats offered to idols, but let's look at some examples that we may encounter today, okay? So I was talking to Jeremiah uh, yesterday, and, and we weren't even talking about this subject, but he brought out how we can perceive things differently depending on our backgrounds and things like that. And so, you know, I, I like to carry uh, one of these around, a bandana. It's really handy for, you know, you could make a sling out of it if you have a broken arm or a tourniquet, or you could even wipe your nose with it or clean your glasses, right? So I carry a bandana around in my pocket all the time. But you know, in some towns I go, uh, I pull out this color of a bandana, and I could be in really big trouble because that would give me the, the, they use this, gangs use this as an, a sign of what gang, uh, what, what is your gang affiliation? A red one or a green one or a black one or a blue one, right? And so what means something to me, completely utilitarian purpose, means something completely different to somebody else. And so I wouldn't be very smart if I paid no heed to that and I went into a place where I knew that if I flashed a red bandana, I would uh, be inviting some big troubles, right? Would it be smart of me to ignore that altogether or would it be wise of me to say, you know what, I think I'm going to keep that stuck in my pocket. <laughs> uh, it, it would temper, I, I could use, it's mine, I could use it all I wanted to, but why would my liberty be confined by somebody else. Well, that's just one little simple example of how that can happen, the, the, an example of varying significance and symbolism in different people's minds. Well, let's come a little closer to home, and some, some, some of you have probably gotten into this debate with people, and that is the, the, the Christmas trees and Easter eggs, right? We're probably all familiar with how these common traditions have roots that are connected back to some kind of pagan god or, or idol worship. Uh, is it a sin to have a tree or hunt for eggs? No, it's not a sin to have a tree or hunt for eggs, all right? But, you know, if you wanted to put trees in your house all year long because you like the smell of the trees, that's, there's nothing prohibiting that in the Bible. And you could probably even find justification for it, as, as indeed people have for, for trees and eggs. But um, it's worth considering if it could be a hindrance to someone coming to accept Christ, or if it could somehow promote idolatry, which, honestly, it's pretty unlikely in today's world. I mean, but if it somehow was a, a hindrance, and you knew it was going to be a hindrance to somebody, it's worth considering. You know, I think I'll forego that. So it's not a hindrance. Now, I'm not judging anybody on, on any of this, all right? I'm just using this as an example of how these kinds of things can come into our lives. So let's, go, let's, dig, let's get into the weeds a little more now. How about blood transfusions? We know that with certain religious organizations, the Jehovah's Witness in particular, 
They refuse to receive blood transfusions based on their interpretation of certain verses in the Bible, Acts chapter 15 and verse 29 being one of them. And that says that ye have, this is the instruction that was given to the um, church in Antioch from Jerusalem, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye, sh ye shall do well, fare ye well. And so with that, they say, well, we shouldn't have blood transfusions. It doesn't matter if their child's dying and could live if they would get a blood transfusion or not. They say, nope, it's forbidden. He's just going to have to die. I mean, I wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for blood transfusions. I had a bunch of them the night of my accident. Uh, they told me at, at 12 years old, I received five units of blood. That's, that's a lot of blood for a, for a body to, to have to receive, but... I wouldn't be alive. But there are groups that would say, no, we can't do that. And so people try to re respect that as much as they would love to save a life, but the parents say, no, they're not going to have a blood transfusion. A blood donor voluntarily donates their blood for the good of others, right? Do we refuse to give blood just because it might of offend our Jehovah's Witness friends or something like that? No, there's a higher principle involved. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10 says, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So we have a commandment to do good. And this is something that's not prohibited in the Bible. It, it does allow us to do good, even to the point of saving a life. And so... If, that, if it might offend some of our friends and we could save a life, we have a higher calling from God to save that life, don't we? To, to do good. Well, let's get into the weeds a little more. How about, uh, you know, I don't know how many of you have this on your, your driver's license, the little heart on there. What does that mean? An organ donor. Yeah, Joy and I have the little heart on there. So, so we're organ donors if something happens. Highly unlikely because we don't drive motorcycles. But at any rate, um, that's, uh, <laughs> you just got my opinion on that, right? Uh, when a person dies, their body can either be laid to rest or cremated, or, or they can donate their organs for transplant, or you can donate your whole body to science for medical students to use, or for research, or for scientific or education purposes. That would be what I'm going to call a consensual organ donation. You voluntarily do that, right? And on a very basic level, then, your organ, say, let's say it's your heart, is just tissue, right? It's just tissue at that point. It's a very common and accepted practice, and it may save the life of somebody else. We don't have a commandment to do that. It's just a liberty that we have that we can do that, and it may save the life of somebody or be used somehow. But what about then non-consensual organ donation, like it took place in Nazi Germany, where people's organs were harvested, whether they liked it or not, or what took place in the, in, in the Soviet Union, or what is taking place today in China. It still goes on in China. They'll take prisoners, and a doctor says, hey, we've got a market for a liver, or a, a spleen, or, you know, or something like or a heart, there's the perfect candidate, same blood type, same execute them, haul it off, make the money, and it, the organ is used. Different story, right? Not consensual. Well, for some it's not a different story because they don't care. It, they're, evidently, they don't care in China because there's a big market for it. And uh, people pay big money, the people that can and the practice continues to this day. But let's say, by accepting that organ, you would be promoting and endorsing that, practices, that practice and all of its injustices. But what, it, what, uh, what if you didn't know about it until after the operation? Let's say you had a child that needed an organ and there was an organ donor and and that was going to be a life-saving operation, and you got the, the new heart, a heart transplant, and you found out afterwards, oh, we got this from the black market in China. 
you're not going to go back and reverse the process, right? <laughs> you're not going to go and take the heart back. Uh, but then what do you do about that? Is God going to hold you accountable for what you did not know? Well, I think he is going to hold you accountable for what you didn't know, but he's going to, that puts the burden on us to ask questions that people didn't have to ask back in the days when this was written. Let's keep moving down into the weeds, deeper into the weeds with this. What about this whole issue on fetal tissue from uh, uh, abortions? There, currently, it's used in two areas, in medical research and also in commercial production and testing. So both for medical uses and commercial uses. In medical uses, uh, research, the practice of harvesting fetal tissue from abortions for commercial sale was outlawed decades ago, but it can be donated to abortion clinics by mothers who then, the abortion clinics can charge a fee, and it's allowed in the law, they can charge a fee to universities and federally funded research agencies for the parts. And if this is used today for a lot of biological research. In 2019, then President Trump, he sharply curtailed the federal spending on fetal tissue for research. He put up severe limitations on it. But Pre President Biden quickly lifted all of those restrictions so that we're back to the way it was. Uh, fetal tissues were used for the development of polio vaccines, for one thing. And so they, they, they're used for all kinds of development and research because of their rapid growing properties. In the commercial production and testing area, this has more recently come to light that tissues from babies aborted in the 1960s and 70s have been preserved and duplicated for use in the production of cosmetics and certain medicines. They're still used today for the, in the testing of medicines and in some of the COVID vaccines, as they're called. And this isn't new. They're also used for the testing of all kinds of over-the-counter drugs, like ivermectin, which was, is it's not over-the-counter, but that's a drug that's used to treat COVID that for people that didn't want the vaccine, but it also has the same testing uh, uses the same, uh, uses this fetal tissue for testing. Um, the monoclonal antibody treatments, they also have used that for testing. Tylenol, Pepto-Bismol, Tums, Motrin, Maalox, Exlax, Benadryl, Sudafed, Preparation H, Claritins, and vaccines used for rubella, hepatitis A, chicken pox, and shingles. It's all been tested using these fetal cells that were taken from uh, fetuses in the, from babies in the 1960s and 70s. So the question then is, we might ask if the Apostle Paul was here, we could ask him that question. Does the use of any of these products actually, you know, what should we do about this? We don't have meats offered to idols, but what should we do about this situation? Does the use of these products actually encourage or promote abortion? I mean, if you take a Tums, are you advertising pro-abortion? Probably not. I mean, somebody's not going to see you eat a Tums unless they have, unless they are very sensitive to this and say, did you know that's one of the products on that list? And, and if you do that, the money you paid for that uh, goes back into this research, and then you might say, no, I don't think I'll eat it. So I don't offend them, right? But the Lord's given us these things that can have good benefits. The Catholic Church organization has decreed that the greater good, which is derived from the use of fetal cells, makes it ethical to use them. And you've got to watch out. Greater good can, is a slippery slope that can use, be used to describe all kinds of atrocities. All right, so greater good in and of itself needs to be looked at really closely. These are bioethical questions that people are grappling with even today. And so, I, again, the principle, the basic principle, we should seek the good of others over ourselves, governs, but look how deep we can go with this in the, in, in the situations that we encounter today with the technologies that we have. 
Let's go into another thing. How about your retirement funds and your investments? Or the investments that the state of Alaska makes with your unemployment uh, wages that goes into that fund. What do they do with all that money anyways? Is your money used to promote different things in, like the sale of alcohol, marijuana, or in media that promotes immorality? Is your money being used to, uh, because they're, your, your, your investor sees that Coca-Cola bottling company is going to open up a new Seagram's vodka plant and it's going to be a money maker so they take your money and they pump it into that to build up that company so you can get a good return on it and you don't know that but you get your your little statement back and it said wow you made $35 on that stock this last month your money got used to invest in the things that we don't believe in and we have no control over it really unless you uh, you, they, you can ask to have only social, socially, it's called social responsible investments. So in other words, their portfolio will limit that. You say, I don't want to invest in any alcohol. I don't want to invest in any, you know, any, uh, anything that's inhumane or, or I don't want to invest in anything that's going to be using any of these abortion things. And your broker or whoever can tailor your investments to that. But how many of you thought about that before I mentioned it? Probably a lot of us hadn't thought about it. I know there, there came, came a time when I, when I started thinking about this and I realized, wait a minute, my money could be used for things that I don't want to support. What can I do about that? Well, invest in gold and silver, I suppose. But, you know, or look into these socially responsible investments. That's another thing that we'd have to do. See, it, it boils down to... You know, if we don't know about this, is God still going to hold us accountable for it? I think, I think to a certain degree we will be held accountable for it. And we have to do some looking around. And it is going to make differences in, in what we, how we behave and what, how we interact in this world. But really, it boils down to the fact that, that we have some liberties. We can make investments. We can have uh, retirement funds. We can use the things of this world. And we could argue that, well, wait a minute, I don't have the, res at some point, if I don't have the responsibility to manage these things, then, then the major uh, accountability is on that person that's using, that's taking my trust and misusing it and using it for things that God doesn't approve of. You know, we can, we can divest ourselves from that responsibility by saying, well, you know, I gave it to them in good faith that they wouldn't do bad things with it. But these days, that divesting of ourselves gets a little bit harder. And if somebody comes up to you and says, did you know that your investment in Wells Fargo, for example, and I have no idea, I'm just pulling that out of the air, if, if some banking company, if, you're, if you have money in that bank, you know what they do with your money? They invest it in this, 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 and this. Maybe it's time to pull your money out of there. <laughs> Maybe it's time to make the correction and say, well, I'm not going to do that. And, and I, I'm not picking on Wells Fargo. It just happened to pop into my mind. So don't, don't think that I'm, I'm saying anything about them. But we do have to make decisions about this. We do have to think about these things. And we go back to 1 Corinthians 10.31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all for the glory of God. Whatsoever ye do, that's a, that covers a pretty broad path and spectrum, doesn't it? From our investments to what we eat, to, to, to the medicines we use, to the, the people we associate with, all of that we want to do to the glory of God. And we get back more to, the, to, to what Paul was teaching the Corinthians. We need to do everything we can that will lead people to Christ and do nothing that would throw a stumbling block in them accepting Christ. And we certainly don't want to lead our own selves away from Christ. In other words, getting so involved in investments and so tied into that that we say, you know what, I don't care what they use my money for, I just want to make money. Well, at that point, I think we've crossed a line. We ought to care what our money is being used for. Or, and, and, and then take the steps to find out. You know, I, my, the guy that uh, carries 
our investments from the various funds that we've had, I rolled it all into that. And I told him, I want to do these socially responsible investments, and these are the things I don't want to invest in. And he said, all right. He did a little looking, and he said, I've got some funds for you to use, and they're not going to perform as, as well as the other funds. I said, that's okay. I'll sleep better at night. That's worth a lot to me. <laughs> and they've done fine. They're, they're, doing, they're doing just great. And at one point, they were actually, when President Trump was in office, they were actually outperforming the other stocks. So it's been reversed now that Biden is in office. But what I'm saying is we want to do everything we can to lead people to Christ. We don't want to, in the case of the Corinthians, uh, give the impression that we can sit and worship idols and we can worship God all at the same time. Because God says... What communion do we have at the, the Lord's table and the table of idols? We don't have communion at both. It's one or the other. We serve a jealous God. So this principle really goes pretty deep, like I said, deep into the weeds of our, of our lives. And it's nice to not ever have to think about these things. But the fact of the matter is we can't hardly exist in this world today without confronting these issues Technology and the opportunities that we have brings a whole bunch of questions then that have to be addressed. And opportunities for us to live a separated life and to lead others to Christ through our separated life, but it's things that we can't just put our head in the sand and ignore. We have to think about them and, and then make the, the changes in our lives. Maybe you can think of some other examples or, or maybe you'd like to talk more about well, wait a minute, what about this or what about that? And uh, that's fine, I'd be happy to talk about that. But These are some things that, that uh, areas where I, I thought we could apply these principles, or this, this principle here, and um, we can, if we look at just the way it's presented in the Bible here and keep it literally and only on meats offered to idols, the bigger message we're not going to get because we're not going to encounter that experience very often. Uh, but when we start looking at the broader idea that goes along with this, then suddenly we, we realize, wow, this touches us in a lot of places. And so this chapters 8, 9, and 10 here in 1 Corinthians are actually very relevant to us to apply in our lives. But it really requires a lot of soul-searching and introspection and examination which is what the Lord calls us to do anyways, isn't it? To, to look into these things. All right. Well, we're going to close there. We're a little early, but we're going to close because we have a business meeting to follow. And so before we go into our business meeting,